When people traditionally come into Westfield, they look at the town center and when it had a central green with traffic going around it and churches around the outside and consider that Westfield is a traditionally designed New England community. It's not the case at all. What is today the center of downtown Westfield was consciously built in the early 19th century, almost 200 years after the original settlement. The original center of town, the original sentiment, was about a half mile to the east in that stretch of Main Street between Meadow and the Little River. That's where the first church, where the first government, where the first homes, where the first growth of this community was. To look at Westfield and its center today, you're primarily concerned with the building of two primary institutions. One was the church. The center of every New England community was the Congregational Church. This is the famous Bullfinch Church, built in 1806 in the center, the new center of town. It was, in fact, the third edifice for the Congregations. And its existence here in this new center was highly controversial. When the decision was made that the old building was falling apart and much too small, each member of the congregation had their own plan for where the new church should be erected. This debate went on for a few years, and it was only settled when someone, unknown, burned down the original church. Now desperation set in and a quick decision was made in 1806 to erect this great wooden barn of a structure. It will last in what will be the new center of town until the Civil War. Around it drew a number of commercial establishments. This is a view of that first church in about 1860. The buildings, which stretched from the church to what is today Main Street, made up what was then known as Rum Row. This was a series of bars, pool halls, and transient hotels made up of the laboring classes in town after the 1840s, largely Irish, and led to continuous struggles between the working class in town, which tended to be Catholic, democratic in their votes, and drinkers, versus the Congregationalists, who tended to be Yankee, Republican, and quiet drinkers at home, not in bars. Temperance was one of the major political issues throughout the 19th and early 20th century. The biggest building on the left is known as the Ives Block, built by the founder of the uh, ironworks in town, which ultimately will become H.B. Smith. This is the church that replaced the Bullfinch Church. It was built in 1860. It's a brick. It is the congregational, first congregational church that exists in town today. It was famous for its 178-foot steeple. And although you may not be able to see in this image, if you look very, very carefully at the top of the steeple, there is a steeplejack up there waving his hat to the camera. This was the most imposing institution in the center of town because, of course, up until 1830, the Congregational Church was established in New England. That meant that the pastor was hired and paid out of the town taxes. It meant that town meetings were usually held 
within the church structure because it was the biggest meeting house in town. And it meant that only members of that congregation were the real powers within the community. In 1830, that legal establishment ended. In the winter of 1886, a nor'easter swept through Westfield and snapped that steeple off and dropped it right into the center of the church. The church, needless to say, had to build a new steeple. And they built this Gothic monstrosity. This steeple overwhelms the small brick church beneath it. It simply doesn't fit New England. It doesn't fit this church. It doesn't fit the community. But it survived until 1933, when dry rot in the timbers forced it to be removed. The church then existed with just a lower stub until 1962, when the current steeple was erected. Here's a view of how that east side of the then green would look in the late 19th century. There is an imposing center of town with the Congregational Church at its center. This is the first town hall. It was built in 1838. Andrew Jackson's battles with the United States Bank ended with its destruction, and the bank's assets were divided up among the states. Massachusetts divided that sum among the towns for the purpose of education. So Westfield agreed that it would create a high school it built this building and then decided it would really rather have a town hall. So the high school was relegated to a single room in the building. It didn't last. Just behind this town hall, you can see the steeple from the old original Bullfinch Church. Being good New Englanders, they never threw away anything. And so when they built the new church in 1860, they simply pulled the old one back, and it became a carriage maker's shed and blacksmith's shop. It would last this way until 1890. The town hall was modernized over the years. You can see in this image, it's got a different steeple. It's now got a round window at its peak, and it's got more decoration around the lintels and on the edging of the roof frame. At this point in time, there's also a police station in the basement. The town hall will look something like this, although the steeple is removed in 1912, but it'll look something like this until the mid-1950s. The police station will remain in the basement. And for a number of years, initially when the normal school was held in this building, and then later when the high school was held in this building, pupils would share their quarters with whomever was in the lockup. The other original and primary institution creating the center of town was a school. This is the Westfield Academy. This building was erected in 1801, so along with the church in 1806, these become the centers of the new center of town. The academy was a private dues-charging high school. It's a feature common throughout New England. New England invented the idea of academies, because the towns, although they were supposed to create public high schools, essentially never did. The difference between the academies and things like the Boston Latin School was that the academies taught a more practical education. The Boston Latin School essentially prepared students for the clergy, or perhaps for medicine or law. Here, you were taught basic mathematics, surveying, geometry, 
perhaps modern foreign languages instead of Latin and Greek, and here also in the academies, women could get an education. The Westfield Academy was quite famous in its early years and drew students from out the northeast of the United States. In an earlier talk, I featured the academy as central to the training of missionaries, particularly missionaries going to Hawaii. In 1857, the academy outgrew at that small building and they built a new structure. You can see the old academy on the left-hand corner of this building, tucked away on the side. This was the Westfield Academy from 1857 to right after the Civil War. Problem was is that high schools had begun to be developed in Massachusetts, including in Westfield. Directly across the street from this academy is the town hall. And in the town hall, in the 1850s, Westfield opened a high school. So, if you were a parent in Westfield, you could either send your child to the free high school, or you could pay tuition and send them across the street to the academy. I think it's easy to understand what a good frugal Yankee would do. The academy began to die, and eventually, in 1867, the town purchased the academy building and moved the high school into it. This building burned in 1890, and the town erected a brand new high school on Broad Street, next to the town hall, which was next to the first congregational church, keeping all the central institutions in the community together. This would remain as the Westfields High School until 1932, when the Smith Avenue High School was built. Then in 1932, this became the Intermediate School, and it remained as the Intermediate School until the early 1960s, when it was torn down and its site was eventually occupied by the present fire station. All of the institutions of the community then, the central institutions, continued on this east side of the green. Broad Street itself was initially a primary residential area of this new center. This is a view of Broad Street about the time of the Civil War. You can see it's heavily treated. We're standing approximately where the statue of General Shepard is today, looking south. Now, this was the primary road south into Connecticut. It is the main communications route between Westfield and its mother communities, which were from Connecticut. In 1860, there were only a few homes on this street. Some of them had been erected in the late 18th century. There was also a blacksmith and a few other uh, primary shops. By the end of the 19th century, this is probably in the 1880s, the street was fully developed. This was the home of the major families of Westfield. In the far distance, just barely visible, is the tower from the greatest mansion that was ever constructed in Westfield. This was the 32-room mansion of the Thayers. There's comment from time to time about why the General Shepherd statue was erected on this spot where the camera is, looking down this street. Well, I like to say that one of the reasons was is that all of the primary families in town, those who called for the building of the statue and who paid for it, were on this street, and the chairman of the board that erected the statue lived in the Thayer home, which is at the end of the street. 
General Shepard is looking down upon his patrons. This is essentially a view of what the center of town would have looked like in the 1860s. As I told you, this was not the center of town in the 1600s or the 1700s. In fact, where the green or the park is today in the center, that was a wet hole. It's one of the reasons that we have a traffic circle there is that the center was wet all the time. It wasn't until the 1830s that H.B. Smith, he would later take over the iron foundry, but in those days he was running a combination bookstore, fruit store, vegetable market in town. H.B. Smith organized a committee to fill this center in plant trees, and build a fence around it. You can see on the left back the first congregational church, and right at its base, although it's not very clear in this stereopticon view, there is the town pump. Because the green was a low spot and water table was very high there, there was a town pump and a horse trough on that corner until the end of the 19th century. Here's another view of the town green a little bit later, uh, perhaps about 1870. The building in the background is the Morgan Block, the first real commercial establishment built around the green in 1820. In 1875, the town got its first piped water from Tekoa Reservoir. The wellhead water pressure was so great that the town decided to erect a fountain in the center of the green. You can see it here, the circular area in the center of the green. And the water pressure was so great that the fountain blew a waterhead 70 feet high, nearly to the top of those trees. The trouble was, they forgot to install a shutoff valley. And consequently, the first winter, they got massive ice fountains, which lasted until the early summer. Eventually, a shutoff was erected, and the town fountain continued with only one problem. The fountain was surrounded by a pool of water about two feet deep. The town regularly had wandering cows and pigs and other livestock. They would get into the fountain and then they couldn't get out, requiring rescues on a regular basis. Here's a view of the mature green, the green that exists in the memory of older residents of town. You can also see that the town has become, has developed a real center. There are three and four story buildings all around the outside. By the late 19th century, new developments took place in town. Much of Rum Row was torn down and the five-story Ives block that was on the end particularly fell to the dust. And here, in 1912, the Federal Post Office was built. The massive granite building, which survives on that corner today, as the Tavern Restaurant. Now, the north side of the green had its companion institutions. When the new brick Congregational Church was built in 1860. The congregation was already much too large to be seated inside. So the decision was made to divide the congregation in half, and a second congregational church was built as a companion church on the north side of the green. Here's the way it would have looked again in the early 1880s a second, large, imposing brick structure. Uh, the four-story building to your far right in this image is the famous or notorious Ives block, which would eventually be replaced by 
the uh, post office, slightly to the right of that congregational church is one of the largest of Westfield's whip factories. This is the American Whip Company. That structure survives today. Eventually, it will be built into a large U-shaped building, which becomes senior housing today. Uh, and just to the right of it, the, the building that exists underneath the trees is the original edifice which becomes the Westfield Athenaeum. To the left are various commercial properties, including the first bank in town, and a national bank. Here's that commercial property on the north side of the green. The building on the end, on the left end, is called the Lewis Bach or in later life, the Morrissey block. It has a variety of lives from hotel to uh, the courthouse. It served as the courthouse for many, many years and various commercial establishments in its base. The building immediately to the right is the Hamden National Bank, the first bank in town. The building to its right housed the first photographic studios in town and is the basis for most of these historical talks, the photographs that were done by photographers who were housed there. And the last wooden building on the end at various times is a Chinese restaurant, a Chinese laundry, and various other commercial establishments. One of the main institutions on the north side was the library. Here in front of us is the original Westfield Athenaeum, 1864. It will remain the library building until 1899. Then a few years later, it will be taken apart. Again, the Yankee mentality survives. Moved to School Street, where it will have a second life as Kelleher's Tavern on School Street. Here's a view of that north side and west side of town. This is one of those photographs that we can date pretty regularly. You can see a light pole here in the left center of the picture. Electricity came to Westfield in 1886, so we know that this photo is somewhere not far after that. The large building in the distance in the center is the Methodist Church. A more modern view of the north side. By now, commercial establishments have grown. There's the steeple of the Second Congregational Church. The large building in front of you is, at this point in time, a car dealership. This is a 1920s image. Uh, it will eventually become Sears and Roebuck. And then after a major fire, it will become Rocky's Hardware. And then about 10 years ago, the Rockies will be pulled back and this will be a parking lot. And here's a more familiar view of the same site. The U-shaped building is that American whip cum U.S. whip. The U on the left side is that American whip building that I showed in the original 1870 image. The lower one-story structure in the center is where the Westfield Athenaeum originally sat. The right-hand wing of the whip building eventually became the Park Theater. And when I came to town in the 1960s, that was the last gas major movie house in town. The west side of the green primary institution was the Methodist Church. This building was erected in the 1840, um, survived as the Methodist Church until the 1870s, and then it became a variety of things. The post office was in this building until the new federal post office was built. Various fraternal organizations had their headquarters on the upper floors, which remain one of the large meeting halls in town. The 
bottom story on the left-hand side was a rather famous grocery store for many decades in town, the Loomis Brothers. And if you go down School Street and look at the wall on that side, there's a fine remnant of that grocery store and an ad that still exists on the wall. Here's a view of that west side of town, probably in the 18, early 1890s. The Methodists eventually needed a new church, and in 1875, they built this magnificent structure, the largest church in town, uh, on the corner of Court Street. This church survived until 1967. The other major institution on the west side was a hotel. Obviously, if you have a green in the center of town, if the communications routes both in all directions meet here in the center of town, you're going to have a tavern. Uh, this exists from the 1830s right up until 1942. There are a variety of names. It has a variety of structures. In this particular life, it's called the Warrenoko House. It will burn two or three different times. Uh, is the Warrenoko House, it's famous for these porches across the front. To its left, there always was a commercial establishment, usually a drugstore. One period of his life, this was the Holland Drugs. Uh, the large multi-story brick building on the right is the hotel. In this life, it's called the Park Square Hotel. It, that building is now gone. And in fact, it's just a parking lot today. The building on the left, however, survives. Now, the top story is gone, but it is the United Bank today. And here is the Park Square Hotel, about 1900. Now, this building will be prettied up a bit and survive, as I said, until 1942. On December 7th, 1942, it burns. And that is the end of the last hotel on the green. Today, that's a this site is a parking lot for United Bank. Here's a better view of the mature downtown Westfield around the green. The tall building on the right is the Methodist Church. The building, then there's School Street. The building next to it is commercial establishments. And to the left is the Park Hotel. There's a horse-drawn trolley in this picture also. The trolleys are electrified in 1895, so we know that this is just before that. One of the reasons the town looks so different now is that these multi-story buildings have all disappeared. In 1946, the Methodist, uh, what had been the Methodist Church, had its top two stories removed, and it exists today as a deteriorating, flat-roofed, two-story structure. The brick building to its left uh, housed in the 19th century various drug stores, and then late in the 20th century housed various restaurants, including Barney's and today a coffee shop. It also had its top stories removed. Next to it, the Park Hotel burned down and is today a parking lot. So it's a much different view of downtown Westwood. In the 1890s, the north end of the green got rebuilt. A horse trough was erected by the Friends of Animals, the Humanitarian Society. There was another one erected on the north side. This horse trough, or more likely the one from the north side, is what survives today as the fountain in the center of the current 
it also got new cobblestones around the green and around this horse trough on the north side. Westfield streets were largely cobblestoned in the 1890s. Before that, they had simply been dirt and gravel, and consequently they were dirty and dusty in the dry weather and mud holes in the wet weather. Another feature of this fully developed new center was the erection of the flag of a flagpole. In 1898, a ship's mast from the Pacific Northwest is shipped east and it will become the flagpole in the center of town. Here you can see the wheel carriage that brings it into the center of town uh, from the railroad. And here we are, July 14th, 1898, when we, on Flag Day, when we have the official dedication of the flagpole. That ship's mast will survive until it gets a too large flag, a serious thunderstorm that makes the flag wet and whips the flag and snaps the top off the pole late in the 20th century. Of interest in this picture of the assembled town is the wagon right in front of us. It is the first convenient food truck in the history of Westfield. It is a hot dog wagon that comes out to town celebrations. And here is kind of the final touch of the sophistication of the center of town, the trolley lines. You could get on a trolley here at the center of town and ride to Pittsfield to Northampton, and ultimately to Brattleboro, to Boston, to New Haven. If you were willing to put up with it, there were communications for a brief period of time in the turn from the end of the 19th into the early 20th century. You also could take trolleys throughout town. They carried people out to Warren Oco Park on Upper Western Avenue, across from where the college is today, or to Hamden Ponds, which was a resort area on the route to Holyoke, or to the major industrial plant of Columbia Bicycles on Silver Street. The trolleys took you everywhere in town. Ultimately, the automobile is going to destroy the trolley lines, and the last trolley runs to Springfield took place in 1930. At the end of the west side of town was Court Street, which will, in the late 19th century, replace Broad Street as the home for the town's prosperous. Here's the way Court Street looked with its shading avenues of elms in the late 1870s, early 1880s. On the right-hand side of the image, the fence surrounds the mansion of James Fowler, which in 1899 will become the new home of the Westfield Athenaeum. And here is an 1890s image of the same street. The Civil War statue, and right behind it, the Fowler Mansion, the first house next to it on Court Street is the house of the Fowler daughter, uh, Lucy Gillett, and her children. Today it is the home of Warnoco slash Berkshire Bank. The Elms survive for another 50 years. Thus Westfield went from a center of town that had originally been a pond hole and an area around it that had originally been a spruce swamp to become the prosperous commercial and residential center of the community that may be familiar to many of the people who are watching this 
story of the development of downtown Wesley.